right. We are here with the one and only Tony <laughs> Giordano, Instagram rock star with 325,000 followers. Tony, thank you for joining us on this Role Models in Real Estate episode. I've been looking so forward to this. And uh, as always, I'm grateful for your time and you're sharing your wisdom. Let's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm grateful for your time as well. Okay, so one question that I start every podcast with is when did you get in real estate? Why did you get in real estate? And talk about your first year in real estate and how it has evolved to where your career is today. Um, so uh, I got in real estate at 20 years old, going door to door to sell cell phones for AT&T, 1998, December 5th. And I was trying to save up enough money to put myself through the fire academy and become a firefighter and uh, was a lifeguard on the weekends at the beach. And I walked into a mortgage company to sell them a cell phone. No experience, no, no bachelor's degree or anything like that, just a type A personality. And the branch manager offered me a job after I sold her a cell phone. And she said, we sell home loans and refinance and didn't even know what she was talking about. And she told me how much money I could make and what I had to do every day and just pound the phones. And I started selling home loans the next day and uh, happened to be good at it. Um, loved the job, loved finance. I loved math. I loved helping people with something so important and feeling important also just at 20 years old. And by the age of 26 in 2004, made my first million in a single year that led to just exploding, owning my own mortgage company. I had three partners. I had it all. I had the, you know, the wife, the kids, the houses, the toys, the classic cars, the paintings, the watches. And uh, in 2008, lost everything in the 2008 and nine housing crash and literally was down to nothing. Uh, a beat up pickup truck after making millions. Um, I had my surfboards, I had my dog. So that's, I guess, really all you need in Southern California, right? You know, I, if that's my country song. Not anyway. a bad life, is it? Yeah, it's, it's my it's country song. Uh, so went through a massive divorce a year before the crash. Oh uh, wait, my youngest son's diagnosed with autism. I go from an 812 FICO score to 496, which I didn't even know you could have a FICO score that low. Um, and finally, summer of 09, fast forward uh, a lot more drama. I'm going to skip. Uh, about September of 09, I got so frustrated with the lending side of the business and I couldn't dig out of the, the hole and everything is gone that I finally just decided I'm switching to the sales side. That's, that's all I'm, I'm just going to become a real estate agent. I already have my license. So I walked into a real estate office, Coldwell Banker in Malibu, sister offices with Beverly Hills, where a lot of those top agents from that office used to send me their clients for loans. So I kind of just thought I'll just join that office since I know some people there. And I handed the branch manager my license and I was a real estate agent now, October 4th, 2009. And within the first 30 days of implementing a couple things that I, I also coach people on today and speak on, a couple things online with website and SEO, as well as social media and a completely different approach to social media, uh, I exploded. And within the first 30 days, got a $5 million listing from a random stranger I added as a friend on Facebook. By the end of 2010, I was rookie of the year. That led to Coldwell putting me on their speaking circuit. Uh, then Realogy, who owns Coldwell, said, we want you speaking for all of our brands. So then I started speaking for all the brands of Realogy and still was producing here in LA as an agent, but now was speaking all over. And then somebody said, you know, if you teach something, you should write a book. So I was like, well, I'll write a book. And then somebody to my left at that presentation said, you're not going to write a book. And I said, that's all I needed to hear. And I wrote the book. Then he said it won't publish. 
So then I got it published. Then he said, it'll never be a bestseller. So then I made sure it was a bestseller. And finally, in early 2012, kind of as a mortgage broker, you know, I, I still was producer, but I, I was an owner and we owned offices. So I had a goal of still owning franchises and being a leader. So somebody, my, my great friend Colette said, if you want to be a leader and you want to own franchises, KW is the best company for that. So I left Colwell, went to KW to start buying franchises and leadership. And that's when Colette introduced me about three months into it to a, a really great guy named Mark Willis, who was at the helm of the company and the CEO who took the company from Keller who to Keller. Wow. And, uh, you and I just started, you know, becoming good friends and I stayed in right. leadership. Huh? We clicked. Yes, we clicked right away. And I remember because the day I came into your office and I had only been with the company for a couple months and now I'm meeting the CEO of the largest entity in the, the world. Uh, I walk in and you go, Tony Giordano, 8912. <laughs> and you said my ABA like as if it was at the top of your mind and already knew my personality assessment, which blew my mind. And the rest is history. But a few years ago, uh, I'm still in production, but a few years ago, I just decided to go out on my own uh, and, and build my own coaching company called Rise. And for the last few years, my wife and I are, are producers. We still sell in LA. And then, of course, I have the coaching and the speaking and writing the third book now. And that would be the best way I can explain my story. That's, that's <laughs> right. Thank you for that. All right. So you wrote the, so the Social Agent, first book, right? Yep. And you had that published in 2011? 2012, early 2012. Wow. This, this was the first one. Right. Pretty skinny. I remember it well. I read skinny. it. I, I think I read it in 2013. But that was the second one, which was a lot thicker. <laughs> okay, so you wrote, you followed up the social agent, the social agent 2.0 in what year? Uh, that came out in 2000, uh, like beginning of 2018. 2018. Yeah. And let's talk about the differences that where, where social media, the evolution of social media how social media has evolved from the original book published in 2012 to the second book published in 2018 to today, because it's such a changing, evolving landscape. Right. Let's, let's, let's dive into that a little bit. So, how has social media evolved? I would say, you know, and obviously that's why I'm writing 3.0 now is because it does evolve, but it evolves in a way that the books stay relevant on the way I teach it is because there's two sides to social media and everybody's focused on one side mostly. And that's the techie side, which is you got to learn from a techie. You got to go to a class where an instructor is like, click this, click that. You're going to do this. You're going to download this. You're going to export this. You're going to enable this setting. You're going to write this code. You're going to hit enable and you're going to hit launch. Like we need the navigators. We need the people to teach us that techie, nerdy, geeky stuff. But once we understand how to do it now, everybody's just a deer in the headlights. They know how to post. They just don't know what to post. They know how to answer a comment. They just don't think to. Uh, and that's the human side to social media. And the human side to social media is actually where all of the ROI comes from. Mm. So once you learn how to do it, you have to now learn the human side and come to the philosophy that everybody you see in a news feed or on a post and on a comment thread, the minute you no longer think it's social media and that you're actually at a dinner table with those 10 people who are commenting on that post of your friend and you don't even know those 10 people, but because you're all mutual friends with this guy and he invited you all to dinner, now pretend you're at a table with them and they all just made those comments. Mm -hmm. how, would you, how would you respond? You'd be like, oh my goodness, you're hilarious. And oh, I never thought about it that way. 
And if somebody said something political, you would ignore it at that dinner table because I'm not going to take sides. I don't know who these people are. But online, we just turn into these robots that just vomit information for no reason, drive boring business down people's throat, never show transparency in who we are as a person. And that's what actually builds the ROI. So I took this human approach. Of course, I had to learn the navigation aspect too, but my books are not written where in the book, you, it'll tell you, click this and you'll see this drop down. And anybody who attempts to write a book about navigation in social media, that book is going to be old in a week. The reason my books don't get old is because I'm not, I'm not sharing that. If you need to learn how to do it, go on YouTube. How do I do Facebook targeting? <laughs> what my book is about is the why you do it. And it's the approach. And the beauty behind that is the approach never changes. It's just the human approach to where people spend time today. It's the modern day barbecue. It's the modern day living room. And way before COVID, this has been the approach for 10 years. What's the number one rule of sales? Go where the people are. And where are people today? They're online. So just like a track of homes that's being built, would you go door knocking in there? No, because nobody's living in the houses yet. It's being built. They're being so, built. Yeah. But, but they say door knocking works. Well, not, not if nobody's home. Right. So then online, if we know people are online today, then we want to go online. But if there's a network where we know nobody, nobody's on anymore, why would we want to spend time on that network? Same as, a, same as a neighborhood. But instead of knocking on the old doors of society, uh, I knock on the modern day front door. And the modern day front door is door clicking instead of door knocking. And my front door says 24 mutual friends, seven similar interests, and you both have a dog named Roxy, and you both love Acapulco. Your front door says nothing. So when the front door opens at a house, you're just in a cold sales pitch, telling them that you're the friendly neighborhood realtor. I'm door clicking, and I have nothing but warm conversation with these people that I'm engaging who I don't even know and then adding them as a friend or following them. So I think that the approach is everything. It's just very few people don't understand that correct approach. I, uh, all right, so the first thing I wanna say is namaste, my friend, because <laughs> I, you know, I'm sitting there going, the divine in me acknowledges the divine in you. That is such pure gold wisdom. Oh, thank you. And I, I have to say that um, the, the whole, if you give the context of a social party. Right. Where, where you're, you're eating with people you don't know. And at a dinner table, you'd have a conversation with those guys. You'd engage. You wouldn't just sit there silent, would you? Right. And now I'm not saying, and I'm not saying you have to do this to every post. Because would you go to dinner with somebody you don't like? Probably not. So you probably wouldn't want to meet their friends too. You're not going to tell them that you don't like them in real life because you're going to you never know where a lead is going to come from. Right. So I believe in numbers like nobody knows if I like them or not. Everybody just thinks I love them. But online, if I don't like someone, if I think somebody offends me or I can't stand seeing them in the news feed, then I'm not going to go sit at that dinner table. I'm not going to tell them. I'm just going to blow right by that one. I'm going to go find somebody who I do like who's a friend of mine. And when Mark posts something and he has 20 comments, I'm going to put myself at that dinner table and I'm going to engage a couple of Mark's friends because Mark is influential, which means most of the 20 people commenting on his stuff are what? They're also influential. They're also career driven. They might be an older demographic. They own businesses. They're motivators. They're speakers. They're coaches because we surround ourselves with equals, as Jim Rohn always says, it's human nature. So I'm going to go into those quality posts from people I actually respect, and then I'm going to build relationships with new people. Well, what I love so much about what you're saying, Tony, is that so few agents and so, so few people actually engage with those that are commenting on their post. Right. And, you know, I, that's where the real gold is, isn't it? 
Yeah, so that that's a whole nother the relationship so, starts. So building contacts online is what I'm saying. Go in a friend's post, find somebody who said something that you agree with or that made you laugh, like their comment, then reply to their comment and give them a compliment like, oh, I wish more people thought like you, you're hilarious. Let them like your comment now and then add them as a friend. I call it the three-step rule when you're building is like them, tag them, add them. But now that I have the contact, now that we are friends on Facebook, what you're talking about is now I post something and they're commenting on it. That's not building the relationship. That's now deepening the relationship. And the more we deepen relationships with people and respond to them and engage them, once again, it deepens. So what did I say is I take approach of human, like I'm in a room with them. Well, now let's say what, what you just said is if I post something and I say, had an amazing time on the Mark Willis role model podcast this morning, and you see my post on Facebook and you say, it was a pleasure too, Tony, amazing information. Thank you so much for being on my, my podcast. And I read your message and then I just go on with my day. That would be equal to you saying that to my face in front of 20 people. Wow, Tony, that was amazing. And I just look at you and go and walk away. Wow. What would you and all those people think? Like, what a jerk. Didn't care. Right. D didn't care. Yeah, where but is I, this guy? But in person, yeah. I would say. Not like me? Yeah, in person, I would say, wow, thank you so much, Mark. Like, I appreciate that. And everybody's like, yeah, I, I do too. Oh, thank you. You guys are awesome as well. So online, when you say it, you took time out of your day to pay a compliment or engage someone. I, I don't even have two seconds to just like your comment. Like, uh, so question, simple. Tony, is liking enough? Because it seems to me like I post stuff. And I'll get, you know, 200, 300 likes right off the bat. It's the people that comment. No, I'm saying so like. No, I'm saying yeah, like. Yeah. I'm saying like their comment. Meaning they commented on my post and now just take two seconds to at least like their comment. If you don't have time to respond to them yet, that's fine. But at least just boom, 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 boom. And like the 26 people who commented on, show them that you've responded, show them that you read, you've acknowledged their, their comment. And it's just this whole human thing that I think people just don't realize the power of these digital relationships. One of the quotes that I open up with on almost every presentation that I've been doing for 10 years is a digital relationship, meaning somebody you're friends with online whether you've ever met in person or not, but a digital relationship online is a hundred times more bonded, effective, uh, connected of a relationship than a real life relationship in the same period of time. What, Tony? Are you telling me a friend on Facebook who I've never met is more of a bonded friend of mine than somebody I've known all my life who's personally in my life? Uh-huh. But here's the key in the same period of time. So if your friend on Facebook, you've been friends for three weeks as a digital relationship, and I also meet a human being at a barbecue, and we've been friends for three weeks, but not online. We only met each other at the barbecue and maybe have texted once. Who in three weeks do I have a tighter bond with? Online. I now know how many mutual friends. She knows we both have the same dog named Roxy. I said something about losing my father to cancer. The guy from the barbecue doesn't know that yet. She sends me an overwhelming private message on how she got through and she read this book and she lost her father to the same cancer. And Tony, I, I feel for you and I'm here if you ever need to talk. But see, we're not, we're, not, we're not realizing the power of digital relationships and the fact that social media or just online media in general take our six degrees of separation and go and right together. Right. You know? right. And it builds I, a bond. I have a question because when I think of social media, it seems to me that the goal for most people is number of followers. 
Yeah. And I'm curious, should the target be number of followers or number of quality relationships? In other words, like when, when I teach database 101, I say, don't get to a thousand, get to a hundred people who, when they think of real estate, they think of you first, not second, not third. You've met them, you know them, you know their dog's name, Roxy, you know about them. So in social media, do you recommend getting to your 5,000 golden ticket number right off the bat? Or do you say, get to 300 quality social media relationships online, which is better? Both, both sides are correct. And right. both, sides must, both sides must be done uh, together. Like you have to do both if you really want the effectiveness. And here's why. Uh, I call it the, you know, I always say this on stage too, because I don't mind uh, saying other people's names is it's the fairy and Buffini philosophy. Fairy says, go after the masses, numbers, 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 law of average, just the masses, which actually will produce business. Buffini says, well, yeah, go after the masses, but make sure you narrow in out of those 2000 people, narrow in a hundred and really deepen the relationship. And if if you're deepening the relationship with them and you haven't got a referral and they haven't benefited you after months of continuing to, to deepen the relationship and you now have a new person that should take their place, but you have this core hundred that's always shuffling and you, all of your business can come from that hundred. Well, here's the problem. If you tell somebody to just go out there and get that hundred, they're not going to be able to because in order to find that quality, you have to go after quantity and so what quantity so what i tell people is I, i i do that same philosophy and i do it online is my database i want my database to have 12,800 people but there's a hundred who are tagged in my crm as the top 100 so that when i hit that tag i now only have their spreadsheet and now i can send them an email or just call or write a note or whatever it might be to deepen the relationship. I'm not going to do that with all the other people. I'm just going to do it with them, but I still need all those people. So when I, when I, or how I exploded per se is when I became an agent, I knew that I needed a website and I built an amazing website that made me look like a rock star, even though I had not sold a house first. And then I use social media from a personal standpoint, even with my business page, but I was more personal and social with occasional reminders, I'm an agent where people could maybe check out the site, but I just like Tony. He doesn't drive boring business down my throat every day. He's just, I I feel like I know the guy. He makes me laugh, whatever. I'm being myself online, being transparent. Well, then I go to a class a month into my career as an agent called Facebook 101. And in this class, this kid said something at the end of the class that changed everything. And he said, in addition to business pages and and your personal pages and all the things that I taught you today, which wasn't really that effective. There were things that he taught that because he's a techie. Remember, two sides like, yeah, that's great. Thanks for showing me how to do this. But what should I say online? I don't know. I'm a techie. Right. So but he did say something that was the human side and he thought it was the least effective thing he had said all day. He goes, in addition to all this techie cool stuff I showed you, a real estate agent or a salesperson in any industry actually should have a minimum of 2000 friends on their personal friend page of Facebook. And I said, what did you just say? He goes, a realtor should have a minimum of 2,000 friends on their personal friend page of Facebook. Mm. And I'm sitting with 380 friends at that point on Facebook, and I got my 400 on MySpace, 09. And I said, that is by far the best thing you said all day. And he goes, how is that the best thing I said all day? And I go, because Josh, sales is a what game? Numbers. And if I go and add 
2,000 people in Beverly Hills, Malibu, Santa Monica, people I have no idea who they are and just start engaging human beings and more on the quality side by going into Mark's post and adding those types of people or that doctor friend of mine on Facebook because he'll probably have nurses commenting on his stuff and other doctors. And I start building and I get to 2000. How would that not work? 2000 additional people now in my market that know I exist that feel connected to me and I happen to be an agent. And so I started doing it and I got to my 2000, but just in the first two days of doing it, this lady I added as a friend named Kathy, who is an attorney from a doctor's post, I added as a friend, she accepted my friend request and three weeks later referred me her dad's $5 million spec home listing in Manhattan Beach and the rest is history. It's just terrific. This is gold. I want to ask you a question. We see that, you know, it started with Facebook. It evolved to Instagram. Now we have TikTok. What, like, where, where do you see TikTok going in the context of the real estate industry? Is there anything there? Yeah. They're not building a business using TikTok. There's something in everything. There's, there's a benefit to all of them. Uh, before I answer that question, I will say to go back to your original question, is it all about the following? No. You know, there are people who have 100,000 followers that don't get anything because they bought fake followers and you'll see them fluctuate. And if Instagram finds out that you bought followers, they'll suspend your account and you can get flagged and lose that account. So it's a horrible thing to do because it's not, it's not real engagement versus the person who's got a thousand followers who crushes it because they're actual real and quality, like you said. So it, I don't want people thinking, just go out to the masses and add anyone. Yes, to answer your question, add, add quality as much as you can, but make sure you're not limiting the amount of quality. And if that amount of quality goes up to a thousand, awesome. If the amount of quality goes up to 200,000, geez, even better. But the average real estate agent who's very good at social media is not going to probably, I mean, it'll probably take years for them to ever hit like something like that, like a hundred thousand. And, you know, that blue check mark of being a verified account is usually an indication because you can't buy them. So that's when Instagram says this person is real it's authentic, it's real influence. Uh, we're we're gonna issue this check mark to them. Um, so don't think it has to be a massive following, go after the quality, but don't limit the amount of quality. And the reason my following is so uh, much larger per se is because of million dollar listing on Bravo that I've been on, HGTV, CNBC. It's not like that just came as a, realtor and that the 300,000 people are following me here in LA. I'm a national speaker, coach. So that's taken years to get to. Um, But your average agent, a few thousand people could absolutely crush it in their marketplace. Now, to answer your question about the trends of social media, Facebook, I consider them magazines. So just like 25 years ago, what do I keep saying? Social media, approach it like in real life. So instead of door knocking, I'm door clicking. Instead of forcing my direct mailer into a mailbox, I'm forcing my direct mailer into the modern day mailbox, which is the new speeds of social media and targeting people. And now I know how many people saw my direct mailer and liked it, tagged it, watched it, shared it, commented on it, how old they are, what interests they have, where they live. And so my approach to what each network is, is real life. They're the modern day magazines. They're the modern day way to brand yourself and remind people you exist like a newspaper. So do young people love that one magazine and old people love that other magazine? 20 years ago, yeah. Which means that if you had the budget, you would have to run an ad in what? Both. Even though the the new trend seems to be this new magazine, the older demographic still loves that one. They still love the newspaper. They still love Wall Street Journal. So we had to stay in all of it. So don't follow trends, follow audience. 
and the audience hasn't left Facebook. It's just a certain demographic of that audience left Facebook. So I still have to make sure I'm highly involved and engaged in Facebook, even though the young generation might can't stand it. But what's funny is all those kids that left when they were 19 and 18 from Facebook years ago, guess who's coming back to Facebook now? Right. Why? Because now I'm 29 and I'm an insurance agent with farmers and I need a business page and I need to be able to run ads that feed into my Instagram business page and I need to build a career and a business. But what does a 16-year-old, 19-year-old need social media for? It's, it's least amount, which is who's dating, who's not, and having fun. And I don't need to do that on Facebook because the new trend is in Instagram. Now Instagram isn't Snapchat. Now Snapchat's not the trend. Now it's TikTok. But we need to follow audience. So what I tell people is any network that has millions and millions of people in it and people are using it, you need to have an account. Whether or not you spend time in trying to build relationships in it, I would say Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Google are the four horsemen per se, of where you're really going to be able to build a business and a brand. And as Snapchat continues to grow, you might need it, but you should definitely have one because it might be someone else's, you know, uh, per preference. And I have to follow be friends, follow audience. See, that's exactly that's such a beautiful statement. Yeah. So TikTok to answer your question, I know plenty of agents, a couple who I coach actually, who are top producing agents that they love TikTok. They actually have TikTok feeding in to their website where you can see their recent little music. And maybe it's maybe they're dancing with their clients and she's handing them the key. Maybe it's doing something with her team. They put the logo on the filter so that when they share the story, like there's just no limit what you can do. Pinterest is still dominant, like if if you use it. So I just say. And I, I talk about all of them in my book, every single one in that it, you should have it and, but then focus on the ones where you think you can get the most ROI. Mm. Tony, that's so awesome. So <laughs> let me ask you a question. When you think of where the puck is going as it relates to social media, what do you see as future evolving trends? Um, so the, the biggest trend that has evolved over the last few years is, is what form of a post gets the engagement. So before we went from evolving to sending emails to people, to social media, to then sharing, to then news feeds, and people were looking at our long paragraphs, but then Facebook and Instagram figured out a way to how to attach a photo to our description. So now we could attach a photo and say something about it. And now people started ignoring the ones with no photos because they were boring. I wanna see photos now because of this new thing Facebook allows. And then the next evolution was instead of sharing a message with an image, now we're allowing you to share a video and upload a video and talk about it. Well, then I gotta do that because each time the networks come out with a new way to post, that becomes their priority to push. So if I try to post a long paragraph right now on Facebook about something that happened to me last night and woe is me, nobody's gonna like that. Nobody's gonna engage it. It's gonna be, it's gonna be so far down the newsfeed, no one saw it. So I have to keep to the trend of evolution of the way I communicate. And over the last few years, everything is video. Whether it's uploading a video you pre-recorded That'll get pushed in front of uh, the audience. Uh, second most effective, that, that's third most effective, uploading a video pre-recorded. Second most effective is sharing a story and doing a little story for 30 seconds on Instagram or Facebook and hitting story because Instagram and Facebook push stories in front of normal posts in the newsfeed at the top. And then the most effective by far with the most engagement and the highest audience is going to be live streaming. But the way to do that is also, there's techniques in doing that. 
uh, how many people are going to watch my live stream if I just live stream at two o'clock? Maybe a good amount. How many people are going to watch that live stream if at nine o'clock I said, hey, everybody, tune in today at 2 p.m. I'm going to live stream. I'm going to get more people now, right? Because now I'm raising the anticipation and, oh, I'm going to mark my calendar. Tony's going to live stream tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. I, I don't want to miss it. So there's techniques behind all of this. But we have to evolve in the way people want to hear our message. And people only want to hear messages for the most part through video today. So my presentation, uh, Video Marketing Mastery, goes into you must create a habit of getting in front of your lens. If you do not create a habit today of trying to get in front of your lens every day and share messages and stories and live streams, no one's going to see anything you post ever again come next year because this is the new evolution and it's going to be here for a while is, is video and virtual and uh, having nothing to do with COVID that just accelerated people's ability to learn how to do it. But the approach to having to be in front of your lens, this is going to be for a while and people need, you know, ring lights that's shining in my face right now so that I look good in front of the lens versus a light above my face, having equipment, having a mic, turning your desks into little studios almost. Those are the people that are going to stand out. You know, um, uh, I tell people even, even presentations, if, if somebody wants to remotely do a, a virtual meeting because they live in New York city and they want to sell their house here in Malibu, and Tony, we, we, we're interviewing agents, but we can't fly out there. We're just going to interview people on Zoom. Even though COVID's gone, let's say it's a technology now that people want to use. It's, it's easy for them to use. So now imagine, this is where I'm saying different techniques. Imagine if I just did this great presentation, you were all watching it. Uh, Mark's fans were watching this podcast. Uh, I enjoyed what Tony was saying. And now he tries to have another person on next week. And that looks like this. Hey, everybody. So my name is John Smith. See, look at the difference. And this is 90% of people in Zoom. They're looking down at their screen because they won't put some books under it to put it at eye level. And they're looking down at the screen. What does Tony always say? Pretend you're in a room with them. This is literally equal to me being in your living room right now, Mark. You telling me to sit down, you'd like to talk with me and me tell you, no, I prefer to stand up. You sit down and I'm going to talk down to you the whole time. Oh, I, I feel diminutive. Right? So this I'm is trying. what it feels like. It feels like you're I'm talking down to you or the opposite. Would I want to do this and look up to you? Well, I do look up to you in general, but now this makes me not look uh, superior or inferior. It makes me look very inferior because I'm looking up and you're looking down at me. Mm -hmm. But here, here we're equal. This is what we look like when we're actually talking in person. Yeah. You know, one of the first things I did when we started doing Zooms was I invested in a laptop stand. Right? right? Just little things you do. So let's talk about that. I want to build my stories. I want to use videos. I want to do the videos in the best way possible, not the best way I know how to do it. What are the basics of that? Like the basic building blocks. Do you buy a notebook stand? I know you buy the lights. Yeah. Um, $120 ring light on Amazon company is called newer N E E W E R two E's newer. They make amazing ring light kits with remote controls. I have like five of them in different places, my offices, my house, my car and the trunk, um, to be able to pop up. You should have a iPhone mic or a mic that you can attach to your, your, whatever device you're streaming on so that you don't have to rely on the devices, Mike. You should have a, a camera, like one of those nice cameras on a little tripod to change your, your webcam to a, a better camera um, that is you know, sitting behind your device or whatever, because 
camera quality is, is important unless you have like a brand new, really high quality webcam in a, in a MacBook, like a new generation. Um, and, 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 and then just start, start going, start streaming, start doing your thing. Uh, make sure you look good on the camera so that, you know, you stand out above the rest. Uh, like I just showed you those differences. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other equipment, uh, you know, make yourself familiar with, with editing apps, you know, so be able to know you can take that video now and trim it, upload it to YouTube, use YouTube's advanced uh, editing platform and creator studio to like do some other things, add a hyperlink, add a button that'll appear in the middle of your video on YouTube, where if they click it, it takes them to your website. Um, so much more you can do, but it starts with, you just have to hit record. Oh, and the thing that you do before everything, uh, even the, the higher end equipment is you wipe your lens. Always wipe your lens, wipe the lens on your phones, wipe the lens on your Mac, wipe the lens. There's so many people who are sending me streams or, or Tony, look at the video I just shot with my client and the whole thing is blurry because they have a bunch of finger grease all over their lens and they wonder why it doesn't look as good. Oh, I think my camera stuck. No, your camera doesn't suck. Like you have a bunch of finger oil on there. Okay, so uh, I'm trying to remember what the name of the equipment that we bought on my team. We bought several of them and it's a little handheld thing that swivels your iPhone or your, your smartphone What's it called? Yeah, those are you. So they're kind of like handheld jibs where a you. Jib. It, yeah. It's like a balance. Yeah, and there's a bunch of different ones, different brand names of them. I I have one. I just never use it because if I'm gonna walk and stream, then this my phone is fine because it it has the shake proof on it, the newer generation iPhones and stuff. So I don't really need the swivel. Um, balance or anything like that. But anytime I'm walking and I'm being professionally shot by a videographer, they of course got the thing and it's balancing and they're doing all these things right. because that then it, then it's needed. But me just kind of going with my own flow, you know, for the people that don't want to have to worry about learning how to use those things. Cause some of those things, the higher end ones are not easy to use. You kind of have to read the directions and learn what the buttons do and how it works. And, um, but yeah, to answer your question, the more equipment you have, the better. It's just gonna make you stand out. Now, before we move on from social media, are there any other nuggets that you wanna drop that would help our listeners? You know, I, have, I, I feel like I have so many, I mean, you know how I am. When you've heard me speak on stage and stuff like that, like, I, you know, London, my wife constantly tells me 30 minutes of you on stage would give them so much. And here I teach for eight hours straight sometimes on stage. And I still don't feel like I told people enough things. So how many more nuggets or things that I could just tell them to get going on is, I mean, just evolve with digital everything. Uh, do your research, take the time instead of binge watching your, your favorite show on Netflix, before you start to binge watch that at nine o'clock, Go on YouTube and just YouTube search the three things you've been wanting to learn that you haven't got around to. What do you mean, Tony? Uh, how do I do Facebook geotargeting? Uh, how do I do advanced Instagram? How do I, how do I learn how to do TikTok? Uh, what should I do as a real estate agent on YouTube? How do I do video? How do I do, how do I get better on, on doing video? Um, you know, I, I tell people uh, when people find out, and I'm, this is not a pitch, I'm just sharing what some people can do is, uh, yes, I have mastery coaching like this, where it's one-on-one -on -one and it's only that agent and I'm, I'm building their business for them. But a lot of people don't know I have a group program where it's just, a, it's just the masses and they pay a lot less because it's group. Well, my, my sessions go into so many different things, Facebook, Instagram, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, YouTube, 
being better in front of the camera, building a team, the personality is like, there's just so many different things that I teach, but that's where a lot of people can learn the, the social stuff. Um, otherwise, ask YouTube, learn. Uh, research to me has always been the most important thing that comes before everything else is the more we research, the more we know what the next step should be. 100%, uh, and 100 agree on that. That's, that's what I would say. More research. Okay, one more question on social media. Stories. Should someone post a video every single day on their stories? Should they post more than one video every single day on their stories? Does that get old? Uh, the topics get old. The, like, meaning the content can content. get old, but the video's not getting old. So... If I go on, uh, if I go on Instagram today and I share something and I share a quick story of my dog doing something funny and being like, seriously, this dog wakes me up every morning at 5:40 on the dot. I'm so tired of it, and make them laugh. And then later that day, I tell everybody like, check this out. I just pulled over. There's a fire right now in downtown. Uh, turn on the news. If you're coming here, you know, don't well, both of those were, were fine. People got value from them. One person laughed and the next person said, you just saved me an hour in traffic. Right. But now if every day, twice a day, I post my dog does this every single morning. And then the next morning, as I said, my dog does this every single morning. And then the next morning, as I said, my dog, so where am I going with this? is if your stories are always just your business, then yeah, people are going to start skipping it. If your story is always about adopting a dog, eventually people are going to start ignoring it. Like, yeah, we get it. That's what you talk about. If your photos are always your new baby that you just had, and now I've been looking at your baby grow every day and she's seven months old and you still post a picture of her every day, that's your, that you get to do that. But Everything in moderation is what works. So switching it up and things like that. If you have enough to say where you can post a story every day, go for it. Well, there's enough interesting events that are going on around us. that if we're paying attention, yeah, we're going to find something that other people are going to like. Yep. It's really about thinking about the people that you are serving that follow you not thinking about yourself and trying to do something that brightens their day in some way. So true. That's a perfect way to explain it. Okay. So Tony, let, let me ask you, you got social agent, social agent 2.0. I know that you have written social agent 3.0. Um, I also know that you've got rise coaching and I want to make sure that people that want to find out more about your coaching program find you. What's the best way they would find you? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, the best way for just the Rise Coaching is risemastery.com. Uh, www.risemastery.com. Um, you can also go to giordano.global, which is my main site of who I am, speaker and everything. Um, those aren't my real estate agent sites that I have as an agent. Uh, so risemastery.com um, and writing this third book will be out. It'll pretty much just be the, it, it's a revision of 2.0. And it goes into, you know, it removes some things and goes in deeper to certain things. And um, so I, I, that will be out soon. It's just we're kind of tweaking it, but it'll kind of be that same front cover of my iPad with just the three instead of a 2.0. Um, and we're just going to kind of keep that series going now with the same book and just keep updating and revising it. And then I know you have inside of you a fourth book that's being written already. Let's talk about that book. And by the way, I want, I want to start, I want to share this quote that, that I read on your Instagram feed. Couple, I don't know whether it was a few days ago or whether it was a few weeks ago, but it stuck with me. And that is don't live your life with the attitude that it can only get better. Live your life with the gratitude that it can always be worse. Do I have that right? 
Is that did, the yeah. Um, is that, is back that back. the background on, on your book? Is it about how you think? It is. It's, it's the, it's my second biggest why is the grad is that quote. My first biggest why is stop focusing on proving the wrong people wrong. <laughs> We're always trying to prove people right. wrong because they're wrong. Yeah. But then we're just focused sure. on the negative. We're focused on the negative. So we're always, we already know they're wrong. Why do we have to prove them? Wrong? We are, you already know they're wrong about you. So stop focusing on proving the wrong people wrong and switch your focus on proving the right people in your life right. The people who believe in you and prove them right over and over and over again. Stop. Really, I, I, I love that so much. And I got to do a little plug for Willis Leadership. My, my core belief is nurture the positive and forward looking and yep. starve, deplete and starve the negative and backward looking. Yep. Right? Very true. And proving, like trying to prove that you're right to make someone else wrong is the single worst person that, single worst thing that you can do to somebody. I know. And it was my. Destructive. It was my. It was really my. It was my it. Yeah, it was my fuel for years was proving people wrong. And I get it. It, it can be motivating. Somebody's the naysayer about you. That, but don't approach it that you're happy you proved them wrong. But when you do prove that they were mistaken, it's what you do with that now. Do you say, ha? Or now that I've shown you that I could do what you thought I couldn't, I'd like to show you how to do it. Come to this side. Stop being a naysayer. Whoever made you the negative person you are that you couldn't achieve your own dreams, come over here to our side. Because the people who will talk negative to you, the people who will be naysayers, will never be a successful, influential person. Think no about that. About it. What, you know what no I think? One, no one successful will ever tell you, no, your dreams are too big. So exactly. the people who are telling you that, they didn't achieve their dreams. That's the last person you should be listening to them. That, that's so wise. You know, you know, I'm a follower of the map of consciousness, yep. David Hawkins. If you're proving someone wrong, you're stuck in pride. Right. If you're stuck in pride, you have an inflated sense of who you are and you're not accepting and appreciating the good in the other person. And they can feel that, right? So you got to move up into courage. You got to move up into acceptance and willingness. And I think it's our attitude and the way that we program ourselves through our thoughts and our emotions determines so much about our success. It does. And it's a lot of the times it's the way we were raised. I mean, this stuff was, was in, ingrained into our minds and, and limits were ingrained at such a young age that it's hard for people to break through those limits you know, consciously and, and now be courage, you know, have enough courage to go and, and achieve what they want. So I would, I would say that those are the philosophies behind the, the fourth book. I've been hesitant to write and come out with this book because social media books are teaching people things, you know, sales books, stuff like that. It changes and they're great, but everybody's been wanting the story like the book that's going to inspire, motivate, tell, you know, all the, the snippets that people have heard over the years. And the reason I've waited so long to come out with it is it's, it's really, it's not an easy book because there's things that I'm saying in that book that people don't know that, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a big, you know, being transparent people are, you know, and I just haven't been ready. And people who know who I'm talking about when they're reading my book, probably will never call me again because they're going to know, oh, he's calling that he's talking about me. Um, but these are things that just happened throughout my life that uh, I had to constantly, you know, beat adversity. And so the book is based on, you know, the moments in our life that define us. Uh, and I feel that we have a ton of moments, but Usually, if you ask somebody, what are the five moments in your life that made you who you are today? 
almost always successful people can name those five moments in their life, like big, big occurrences, whether negative or positive. And so the book is based on those five aspects. What were the five moments that defined you that made you get to that next level? And I kind of share my five moments. And then I share how we respond to those moments and become who we are. And I have a title for the book and I've never said it on any podcast or anything, but because you and I kind of briefly spoke about it, uh, now I feel like, why not? Um, is when I, one of those moments of the five moments that I have, and then of course, remember, there's a dozen moments under each of those five, but it's really five big turning points in life that I think, you know, abandoned, you know, uh, could be abused, whatever, but moments. And uh, one of the moments, I believe it's the third moment, the third main moment was losing everything in the crash and divorce and youngest son's diagnosed with autism. And it defined me. I had to either, I had to either wither away or I had to stand up, dust myself off and, and keep moving. And after I was going through it for a few months and it just kept getting worse, I've lost everything. I get this overwhelming card in the mail from somebody who lives in my town, who I talk to all the time, but she felt like just sending me a card. And I wish I had the card. I have no idea what happened to this card, but the card went into this long, like, I'm happy for you. you I know it's tough right now, but you're going to be better overall. You're going to learn from this, both on the business standpoint and your personal life and everything that's happening on that side and that front. And you're by yourself now. And I know it's lonely and I know you don't feel like you have all the friends you grew up with anymore because they turned your, their back on you because of that religion you were in and they choose religion over spirituality and just all of these things that I was going through. And at the very end of this overwhelming card, running out of room, she put, here's to being. And I read it and I'm already kind of in tears as everything else she said. And I turned the card over because like she ran out of room, like here's to being what? And there was nothing on the back of the card. And I was like, here's to being, here's to being what? So I call, I text her and I go, hey, at the, your card was amazing. Can't wait to see you later this week. But uh, I think you ran out of room. Like you, you were going to tell me here's to being like, here's to being motivated or here's to being like, whatever. Positive, whatever. And yeah. she goes, no, that's what I meant. And I go, here's to being what? She goes, whatever you want. Finally, be you. Like you actually get to exist because you've been confined and controlled your entire life. So here's to being, Tony. Here's to actually, what do we call ourselves? Human beings. If we're not being what we want, we're not human. That's the way I look at it. You know, I, so I, the I, name of the book, here's to being. That resonates so much with me because I think people focus on what they need to do rather than who they need to be and who they are being. And it's be, do, have. Yeah. But people focus on have, do, be. It's, it's got to start with who we are internally. B is such a... I just, I just love this story so much, Tony. I'm so grateful you're, you're sharing this. Oh. And, and it's, it's... And see, that's actually... So valuable. You're, you're, like, you're like I am. I think of things as I talk all the time that are like new philosophies. And now I have to write something because you kind of hinted on it. And here's to being is that is now I'm thinking right now as I sit here, B is probably the most powerful, shortest word in the, in, in, in language, like a two letter word that is so powerful, B. Well, beyond that, we can't change yesterday. Right. We don't know about tomorrow. That's what we've got right now. That's the if. And right now is beingness, right? Yep. Right now is who you're being. 
Yeah. And, you know, that's the one thing we can control other than how we think in our relationships is who we're being. Right. So true. That's, that's beautiful. I, I love it so much. And by the way, I could go off for another hour just on this conversation. I, I could. It, it energizes yeah. me. Like it gets me going. It, it's I beautiful. Could. Same here. Okay. So, uh, Tony, I know, and we're, we're kind of getting to an hour, and I can't believe we've been talking for an hour, and I could keep going for another five hours. This is so engaging. I want, I want to make sure that everybody who's listening knows that you still have a sales career today. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so, uh, and, and thank you. Um, I kind of have four main pillars of my life. There's Giordano.global, which is the speaker, coach, you know, author. Then I have Rise Mastery, which is just my coaching company. Then I have the Opulent Agency, which is a luxury real estate advertising firm. It's not a team. It's not a brokerage. It's just a company that agents hire to co-market their luxury listings. And then my wife and I have Modern Group, formerly Giordano Group, which is our business as real estate agents here in LA. Opulent is global. Uh, agents anywhere can use them. But Modern Group is our, you know, uh, practicing business and brand. Um, and that's just us acting as agents here in, here in LA. So I kind of have those four main worlds um what i love about that is that you're still in the trenches yeah of selling real estate day to day and it gives you that gives you just a little edge of wisdom about what the people that you're coaching are dealing with it gives you a little extra wisdom about what works in building your own business with social media strategies so i i really respect the fact that, that you are still a practicing real estate agent? Well, and yes, I, I believe, uh, and it's not, because I, it's not because I want to be. Uh, I, the only thing I love about this business in the production side is negotiation, the hunt, and getting the deal and getting the signature. Once that's done, everything else that actually we have to do in order to actually get a commission check and close that thing I hate. And that's actually the most important stuff. The negotiation and getting it under contract, it's easy for me. I love doing it. But all the other stuff, I can't stand. And so my wife, London, who's my business partner, who convinced me to go back into production uh, not that long ago, because I was out. I was just leading, you know, and referring out. Uh, she convinced me to go back because that's all the stuff she loves. She loves the, the hand holding and the opens and the showing and, and disclosures and, you know, helping them with the, the process. I, I, I don't like showing houses. I just like, ugh, kill me now. So I believe the reason I'm in production more than anything is because of what you said. When, when coaches are in the trenches still, they're able to respond and, and direct with experience. So I think that business, often you have these coaches, uh, the majority of the time, 90% of coaches in a, in a lot of different industries in business, uh, maybe were never top mega salespeople themselves. They had a knack for coaching. They do coaching. Maybe they were a top salesperson, but retired and now have a desire to coach. But the things they're coaching on the agents are like, that doesn't work. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. What about this? What about this new technology? Well, I don't understand it. And I don't, I, I think it's a waste of time. It's because you don't do the most important thing, which is research. And the more you research, the more you learn, and then you could help me. But I, I compare coaches to real athletic coaches. So Phil Jackson and Kobe Bryant, Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan, two superstars, right? Was Phil Jackson coaching them outside the arena? No. Like, he's in the arena. Uh, what, what he was doing was bringing them value outside the arena. Yeah, sure. he's bringing right. them value outside of the arena, but is, are the coaches on the sideline in the game? Are they actually able to direct the ref and say, how dare you call that? Don't, I swear, if you call that one more time. 
even athlete coaches are in the game and trenches still. But in business, it's often not that. They're not in the trenches and they're just saying, just do this, just do this. And it's, it comes across like it's just babysitting coaching. Like, did you make your 100 three-pointers that I asked you to do yesterday, Michael? Uh, yeah, when in actuality it was only 20 and he's lying to me. But because I'm not there, I, I have to believe him. So I like to put myself in the game from my own standpoint, but then now I can direct them. And now I can actually understand them too. Like Tony, I, I, got, I got yelled at yesterday because uh, I did this and, and the seller said this to me and now they're, they're, they're about to cancel. And that just happened to me three weeks ago. And here's how I overcame it. And here's what we did. Oh my goodness, I didn't even think about saying it like that. Like, so, yeah. And yet your role in the game is your sweet spot. You see that, you know, when you think about the road to riches or the way to make money, it's not a wide focus. It's a very narrow, well-defined, deep focus. So you found where you're the best in the industry and that is negotiating. And that puts you in your sweet spot. Yeah. And that's where you provide the most value and that's why you succeed the way you do. Tony, this, this podcast, I, I'm telling you, it's been, it's been such a learning experience and learning journey for me. I've loved every second of it. I'm so grateful that you've shared your time, your wisdom, your energy, your spirit with us today. And I'd, I'd like to follow this up and do another one really, really soon. I would love to. Just, just know that if, if there's ever a time where you've commented on my Facebook and I haven't commented back, <laughs> I apologize for that event. And uh, I've, I've learned a lot today. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You, you are a social media icon okay. and somebody that I've learned so much from. You set me up on social media you got me on this journey, albeit a little bit late. Um, and I'm, I'll forever be grateful for you. And I consider you a really great friend. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Right back at you. I, I respect you so much, value our friendship so much, the times we've had together and the people we've met together. Things I've learned from you. I mean, I could do a 60-minute presentation on everything that Mark has taught me and is the reason I accelerated in a certain uh uh, aspect of my business or personal life, even with letting go. And, you know, I, I, it's easy for me to tell people, you know, live your life with the gratitude and, and focus on proving the right people, right. But I constantly have to teach myself and remind myself to do the same. I const I, I've probably done a dozen things in the last week that are the pride and just not having the courage to just go beyond it and just showing nothing but pride because of my own issues. And, and I have to, I have to fix my, I have to coach myself all the time. Tony, we all do. Yeah, we all do. It's whether or not we recognize it that yeah. matters. Like when you slip down into pride, just recognize it. Let's do a follow up on this really, really soon. I, uh, again, I just want to say thank you so much and tell you what a great learning experience this has been for me and i know it's going to be a great learning experience for all of our listeners and our viewers and uh anybody who wants to know more go to giordano.global and you'll get and and again you'll find everything from you, yeah. you'll get just gems of wisdom from mr giordano so thank you so much we will uh, catch up very, very soon. All right, sir. Thank you very much for having me. All right, Tony. Uh, Thank okay. you.